Well, good afternoon, brothers and sisters, uh, young people and friends, and uh, anyone watching online. What a remarkable time it is that we are living in. The worry and, and excitement and uncertainty that, that we may have had yesterday, when for many of us we woke up and uh, we were looking at the news and starting to, to see unfolding before our eyes a very serious conflict in the land of Israel. That the president had declared war. That's of real significance, isn't it? And as Christadelphians, as our brother Johnny made clear in his prayer, we don't take delight in warfare. We don't look on and think, well, this is great. You know, the, the, the Israelis, they've turned the tide and now they're winning. And they're... We simply are as observers looking on and seeing how the things predicted in the scriptures are perhaps starting to come true. Of course they're coming true, but perhaps they're starting to show to us that the time is soon to be near when the Lord Jesus Christ will be sent back to the earth. So let's just set a little bit of context into what it is that the situation is at the moment. Now, uh, my sort of last reference for this was probably about five o'clock this morning, so it may not be quite accurate as we speak. And this is obviously a rapidly moving situation, and so our numbers won't be accurate. Um, almost certainly today, those numbers will have gone up significantly. So we understand that fighting has raged into a second day because Hamas launched an unprecedented attack on Israel. That that attack involves them firing mm -hmm. over 5,000 rockets from Gaza into the land of Israel. And as a result, Iron Dome, which is the Israeli defense system, was overwhelmed and, and unable to cope with that level of rockets. Hamas fighters, we're told, have taken a number of civilians and soldiers hostage. Uh, a dramatic development captured in videos shared widely across social media. So uh, Ham Hamas are able to make use of social media platforms to, to get the, their rhetoric out right across the world very, very quickly. That they're in control of the situation and that they've taken significant numbers of hostages. There are fears of broader violence where fueled by an exchange of fire at Israel's border with Lebanon and a deadly shooting of Israeli tourists in Egypt. So Egypt, let me ask the young people, let's keep them uh, on their toes. Egypt, boys and girls, is that north or south of the land of Israel? Is that north or south? Go on, go, go on. South, great job. Are you going to say south? You would have been right, good boy. So in the south of the land, uh, in Egypt, there's some sort of conflict there too that's causing some concern. They're wondering if this could get even bigger than simply, as it were, the land of Israel. In addition, in Lebanon. Now, is Lebanon north or south of the land? Now, here's the clue. If Egypt was south, what are your thoughts on Lebanon? Let me come over there, guys. Yes, I knew you'd know. You're so smart. So, this conflict is perhaps going to get hold in the north, in the south. It's certainly in the land around the Gaza Strip. In the early hours of this morning, 200 Israelis had been killed. Israel's foreign minister said at least 313 people were killed in Israeli strikes on Gaza, the Palestinian health ministry said. So you're talking well over 500 casualties this morning. It wouldn't surprise me if that's gone up significantly to many more hundreds already today. And so as a result, the prime minister Netanyahu vowed that his country would take mighty vengeance for the attacks. So these are his words, that he will take mighty vengeance for the attacks, urging the residents of Gaza, now over two million people live in Gaza, in that very, very confined space, we can picture it, it's the Philistine territory, isn't it, on the western coasts of Israel, over two million people live there, and his advice to every resident is get out, get out. So <clears throat> we're clearly concerned about the horrors of war that could quickly escalate. They've cut off already the electricity supply. They've, they've cut off food supplies going into Gaza and coming out. So very quickly, siege warfare of sorts will take place and a major humanitarian crisis will start to unfold this week 
the next couple of weeks in Gaza. Israel's Netanyahu, Reuters news agency, mighty vengeance against Hamas. And that's why we read Psalm 94. Should we just open our Bibles at Psalm 94? Because Psalm 94 sets our position as Christadelphians that we're not looking for Israel to take mighty vengeance or, or, or the Palestinians after that to take mighty vengeance. Vengeance is God's. He is in control of the kingdoms of men and gives it to whomsoever he will. And so we read in Psalm 94, O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth, O God, to whom vengeance belongeth, Show thyself. This is the Christadelphian prayer today. This is our prayer today. That when we look at the horrors of the conflict that's potentially going to start to unfold in that land, our prayer is that the God of heaven and the earth, the God of Israel, will show himself today. Lift up thyself, thou judge of the earth. Render reward to the proud of Lord how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? It's the question on all of our lips, isn't it? When we see another situation escalating, we were hoping that we wouldn't see another escalation of violence in the land, that peace would develop in that land before the king of the north in Ezekiel 38 would drop down. That's what we were hoping for as Christadelphians. But today there's violence and there's conflict. And so we ask the question, how long, O oh Lord, shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? How long shall they utter and speak hard things and all the works of iniquity boast themselves? They break in pieces thy people. This is our prayer. They break in pieces thy people, O oh Lord, and afflict thine heritage. They slay the wicked and the stranger and they murder the fatherless. And that's what we've seen in the last 24 hours in that land. Now we ask ourselves the question, well, why has this suddenly happened now? What's been going on that, that in a moment, without any prior warning, suddenly the world woke up to see Hamas having broken through the border fences in Israel itself, taking hostages, killing indiscriminately men, women, disabled people, children. How has this happened? Why now? Well, we're interested to know that it's the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, which was the last major assault by the Palestinians into Israel. Now that's just extraordinary, isn't it? That on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, 50 years ago, to the day, October the 6th, these militants have come and they have reenacted in many respects that war. Let me just, for the sake of the young people, when we talk about the Yom Kippur War, unless we've happened to have done some work on it, we might think, oh, you know, what, what are we talking about? So just have a little read of that slide there. I'll sort of paraphrase it for you. So this is nothing to do with what happened yesterday. This is describing the Yom Kippur War 50 years ago. A surprise attack on Israeli territory by, an Arab, coalition, by Arab coalition forces on October the 6th, 1973 began the final and bloodiest conflict of the Arab-Israeli wars. October the 6th, 2023, marks the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, also known as the Ramadan War. The writer for the American University uh, here, can you imagine when they pen these words, talking of October the 6th, 2023, being the 50th year? Do you think for one moment they thought that another surprise attack was going to come to Israel. So you, you can see that from the Palestinians, there's a sense of history and there's a sense of this is our time and this time we're going to make it count. This isn't going to be like the Yom Kippur War, which in 19 days, 
the, the, the Israeli army completely dealt with the Palestinians and, and their, their Arab coalition. This, from their point of view, they're not taking another risk like that. This is 50 years on, and they mean business. And so we're seeing that Israel's enemies are seeing a weakness. There's this 50-year anniversary. That, that's one of the drivers, no doubt. You know, there's, that's no coincidence, is it? But in addition, the country of Israel is in, in a sort of unprecedented weak point. As so many democracies are across the world, certainly from their inception in 1948. So here we are, 75 years on from 48, and the struggles of democracy that we see in nations across the world are hitting Israel. We're seeing, aren't we, governments that can't make decisions because society is so polarized that democracy is broken. You've got 50-50 every time. And in a democracy, you can't have 50-50 because you can't make decisions. And so uh, the current government are only in having had a hung parliament, and that's pretty normal in the land of Israel. But they have to do deals with various folk to be able to get a government together, uh, to create a government. And, and this government has been in for a year or so, less than a year, and they're struggling. It's not easy for them to make decisions and, and to, to push policy. That although they've been elected on a particular policy, they're crippled when then trying to push their policies through. We see it closer to home. You, you see it in Canada. We see it just south of here in America, you know, in a very global scale. You see it in the UK. This uh, article this morning, uh, rather, this is uh, further back. This is in July, but it's significant because it just demonstrates that even back in July, there are commentators seeing <coughs> that Israel's enemies would be ready to take opportunity. Let's just read it. The crisis sweeping Israel. So this isn't talking about this weekend. This is talking about the last few months has become a focal point for its enemies across the Middle East who convened top-level meetings to weigh the turmoil and how they might capitalize on it. Foes, including Lebanon's Iran-backed Hezbollah, have been crowing at the sight of Israel fractured by the crisis ignited by government moves to overhaul the judiciary, especially threats by reservists to stop showing up for military service. So, you're Hamas. You're watching that the reservists in Israel that for so long, the reservists turn up. They turn up. That's what it is to be Israeli. But this last six months or so, because of what the government has been trying to overthrow uh, in terms of making changes to the system of the judiciary, we've all seen that in the news, there, many of the reservists are saying, well, you know what I'm going to do? The stance I'm going to make is I'm not going to show up for military service. And Hamas goes, great. A Hamas source declined to comment on the account, saying there are ongoing discussions between Hamas, Iran, and the Quds force over the situation and discuss ways to upgrade the work of resistance. This headline is from today. The significance of why Hamas chose to attack Israel now. This former US official or former US officials say the group and its Iranian backers tried to exploit Israeli political divisions and to derail historic negotiations between Saudi Arabia, Israel, and the United States. Iran is seeking to put pressure on their impeccable foe Israel with this attack, said this retired Navy admiral. In an interview with NBC News last month, the Iranian president said, we're against any bilateral relations between our regional countries and the Zionist regime. In other words, what he's saying is, we are not happy at the idea that Saudi Arabia, this big, big player in the Middle East, will normalize their relationship with Israel, that they will accept that Israel is not their enemy, that they will negotiate and have a peace deal with them, and moreover, they will create economic ties between the nations. Iran is unhappy about that idea. We believe that the Zionist regime, 
of course they're talking about Israel, is intending to normalize this bilateral relations with the regional countries to create security for itself in the region. As the talks with the Saudis, Israelis and Americans progressed, Palestinian disappointment rose. There is a palpable frustration among the Palestinians at seeing the Saudis and Israelis moving closer. So that's just in the last few weeks. That's this news headline trying to reflect on why Hamas chose to attack Israel yesterday. And, and that issue of Israel's relationship with the Saudis is, of course, of great significance. Can we open our Bibles again to Ezekiel 38? You, you know well that Ezekiel 38 sets for us two groups of nations. We could turn to Daniel 11, but Ezekiel 38 is a little easier for this. But Daniel 11, we have two groups of nations. We have a king of the, I'm pointing up this way, so it must be the king of the, you're going to tell me, the king of the, and we have a king of the, in Ezekiel 38, we have just the same thing. So the first few nations we see, Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, in verse 2, that is the king of the, However, when we go a bit further, verse 13, and we read of Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, that is the king of the... Yeah. Right? So we know these things, don't we? And Sheba and Dedan, young people, children, if you're making good notes, you want next to Ezekiel 38, verse 13, so you can write this in your notepads, Sheba and Dedan, here we've got the Gulf states, or Saudi Arabia. So that's why there's been such excitement in the Brotherhood as Christadelphians, any Bible students, to see the Saudis come onto a side which is not aggressive towards Israel. The aggressor <laughs> towards Israel, well, who's the aggressors? Well, you've got Gog of the land of Magog. We understand that to be Russia. We also can see that with Russia, verse 5, are Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya. So Ethiopia and Libya, we're talking there about North African states. But Persia, give me another name for Persia. So, boys and girls, young people, in your notes, Persia equals, we're going to be the maths here, Iran. Or if you're from these parts, Iran, right? So Iran. So Persia is Iran. OK. Well, we've just seen that there's thought that Iran, which is a big, big country to the east of Israel and is very clear and open about the fact they want to see Israel destroyed, that Iran is supporting this war that Hamas is bringing into the land of Israel. So let's go back to this Saudi issue, because it's really, really been ramping up. Many of you who are watching the news will have seen over the last few months that there seems to be, you know, quite often there's something on the news, you know, Israeli, Saudi Arabia, is, is something going to happen? And then Benjamin Netanyahu just just over two weeks ago, two weeks, two days, spoke to the United Nations. He spoke to the United Nations for the first time, actually, in four or five years. I can't remember which, four or five years. He hasn't been onto that platform for some time. But he was given the platform again. He came and spoke, uh, as Netanyahu so often does. He speaks to an empty hall in the United Nations because so many of the world's countries walk out. But he spoke nonetheless. And in his speech, he said this. When I spoke at this podium, here's our answer, five years ago, I warned about the tyrants of Iran. They've been nothing but a curse, a curse to their own people, our region and the entire world. But I also spoke about a great blessing I could see on the horizon. The common threat of Iran has brought Israel and many Arab states closer than ever before. The day will soon arrive when Israel will expand peace beyond Egypt and Jordan to other Arab nations. 
Now, I don't want to make a big deal of this, but, uh, but uh, you all might be saved by the bell here. That's good. That's good. The bell's gone. So, what he's saying is that we've had normal ties, relationships with the likes of Egypt and Jordan for decades now. But he says, I'm seeing a time when this is changing. The Abraham Accords, which is where Israel normalized relations with four other Arab countries, heralded the dawn of a new age of peace, Netanyahu continued. But I believe we're on the cusp of an even more dramatic breakthrough, a historic peace between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Such peace will go a long way to ending the Arab-Israeli conflict, encourage other Arab states to normalize relations with Israel, enhance the prospect of peace with Palestinians, and encourage broader reconciliation between Judaism and Islam, Jerusalem and Mecca. All these, he says, are tremendous blessings. So, the United States administration has been working and working behind the scenes to try to get this deal done. You can imagine that if you're Biden in a presidency that isn't necessarily going quite as you planned it would go, that what do you do? Well, you do what Trump did in his previous presidency where he got his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, working so hard, didn't he, in the Middle East to develop the Abraham Accords. And Biden can see that as a foreign policy, that's a sound foreign policy. He's desperate for a second term. He's desperate to, to get into White House again, to, to, to not be overdone by the likes of Trump or whoever else it may be. And he's pushing, pushing and pushing for the normalization of these ties. And Hamas and Iran and Hezbollah and the like, they can see this very well. And they can see the writing on the wall that the Saudis are really, it seems, going to look to make this deal. <coughs> The Economist, just in the last couple of weeks, America, Israel and Saudi are at the cusp of a deal. Netanyahu made clear, Palestinians must not have a veto over Arab-Israeli deals. Netanyahu, apologies, tells the United Nations. So just two weeks ago, he stood in the United Nations. He explained what his vision for the Middle East was. He showed the corridor that if you could have peace going from the likes of Saudi through Israel, that the economic ties could, that, that the whole region could prosper in their links to Europe. Hamas and others are watching on. And Netanyahu tells the United Nations, and all those who are prepared to listen, the Palestinians must not have a veto over any of these deals. And the Palestinians say, yes, we will. We are going to veto this deal. The Jerusalem Post, just Friday. Saudi Arabia has given up on Palestine with Israeli peace, terror chief. Now, just think about this. You're Hamas. You wake up on Friday morning. The conflict ha hasn't started yet. You haven't been given the go over from the generals just yet. But you wake up and in Gaza is the Jerusalem Post. And you can see that an article in the Jerusalem Post, Saudi Arabia has given up on Palestine with Israel peace, the terror chief says. Hamas, they were so convinced, the deal was so close. And then the call is given from the general. I, I would think that many of those footmen Many of them who are dead now or captured themselves by the Israeli army. I imagine that many of them wouldn't have known a huge amount because the secrecy in what happened. How did the Israeli intelligence not pick up what's happening here? It must have been kept so tight at a strategic level by backers like Iran with the, uh, the, the, the leaders of Hamas, that the call then comes. You imagine that in the Jerusalem Post, being the driver for many. We'll show them. And so the headline writers we've seen yesterday, Hamas violently forces detour from the Saudi-Israel momentum. Iran's support for Hamas fans suspicion 
It's wrecking the Israel-Saudi deal. Hezbollah, Hamas attacks are a message to Saudi Arabia. The Spectator yesterday, Hamas is targeting Saudi-Israeli peace talks. And in all of this, there's more going on too. Yes, they're, they're targeting those peace talks. They don't want Israel to normalize relationships with Saudi Arabia. They're an Arab nation. They're to stay an Arab nation. They are to have conflict. They are to be an enemy of Israel. We must not normalize those relations, says Hamas and the like, and Iran. Uh, brother John sent me this article uh, at about six o'clock this morning. <laughs> I, thanks, Brother John. I haven't thanked you yet. Um, uh, th this is um, uh, a lady, uh, Melanie Phillips, who um, is clearly uh, a news writer. And uh, she wrote an opinion piece um, yesterday, The Barbaric War Against Israel. She says, and this barbarism has been paid for by the US and the European Union. What did they think? All the money they were channeling, channeling, channeling into Gaza for humanitarian purposes would actually be used for. Now, she writes, we have the answer. What did the Biden administration think would be the result of appeasing, groveling to and funding Iran, the paymasters of Hamas and Hezbollah? Now, it has the answer. America, the EU and Britain have consistently undermined Israel's attempt to defend itself against attack. And so she's looking on and she is furious, as many others are, that these world leaders, the likes of the US, the EU, she mentions Britain, have turned their back to an extent on giving full support to Israel. That, that, that Biden reversed America's foreign policy or he went back to a previous foreign policy, in fairness to him, to start providing uh, monies to the likes of Iran and to Hamas. And her question is, what did they think that money was going to be spent on? Well, needless to say, Biden offers Israel support, although for those reasons he faces criticism on Iran at home Trump, well, you can imagine, he, he jumps to it. Accuses Biden of helping fund Hamas attack with the release of a six billion fund to Iran. So we've seen how Israel's internal struggles, the, the, the problem they've had in the government in trying to make the changes, the judiciary, and the, the, uh, the fact that so much of the nation has risen up against that and, 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 and have you know, been furious with the government for looking to make those decisions. We've seen that the government is crippled by the fact that they don't have a majority. And so their ability to actually make decisions and enforce policy that they've been elected on is almost impossible. It's so, so difficult for them. We've seen how Iran is a player in the background, sponsoring the terrorist organizations of Hamas and, and, and Hezbollah particularly. We'll see if they get involved in the conflict. We, we've seen that Israel's major ally in the United States has lost its focus in supporting Israel and has inadvertently, at best, provided possible resources to Israel's enemies. But there's one major player that we see here in Ezekiel 38 that we wonder what their contribution may be to this situation. Go of the land of Mago, Russia. Yesterday, Putin had something to say. And interestingly, where the Western world, the leaders quickly said that they respected Israel's right to defend itself. Now, that's what they'll say on day one. We'll see if that support stays strong this week or next week or the week after when the casualties soon change and the balance of casualties will undoubtedly be significantly more with the Palestinians because of the the arsenal of course that the Israeli army has at its disposal and so today yesterday the western nations say we support Israel we'll see what that becomes 
But needless to say, Russia didn't say that. Russia called on Israel and the Palestinians to have a ceasefire, but of course started with the we respect the two-state solution. And in so doing, his rhetoric is very clearly, although seeming to show 50-50 support, the world knows very clearly whose side Russia is on. Russia exploiting Hamas' attack on Israel to divert support from Ukraine. So there are commentators that feel strongly that what's happening is that Russia, the, the Hamas militant organization, has had in the last few months several meetings, top-level meetings in Moscow with Russia. They believe that Russia is perhaps behind some of this, or at least part of it. We know from Ezekiel 38 that Iran is with Russia at the time of the end. They believe that Russia is wanting the West's resources and at the very least their eyes to be diverted from Ukraine so that they can finish the job that they've started in Ukraine. Russia is behind Hamas attacks on Israel, expert. Russia alleged to be behind Hamas terror attack on Israel. Hamas attack on Israel could be influenced by Russia, this uh, Eastern European, this Estonian official. The ongoing military conflict between the terrorist organization Hamas and Israel may be related to Russia and Iran, according to this politician. This will deflect attention from Ukraine, he added. The timing and reasons for the Hamas attack are linked to Russian and Iranian interests. Hamas is known to be strongly supported by both countries. Hamas leaders have twice held consultations in Moscow in the last 12 months. It's quite obvious that Russia has a wider interest in both distracting attention from Ukraine and, on the other hand, complicating Israel's rapprochement with Saudi Arabia by creating tension in the region. So that, to me, seems like a pretty good summary of why it is Russia may well be involved in this conflict. Hands that pushed Hamas attack forward are in Moscow. This was um, texted to me this morning by uh, Brother Stephen Palmer, who, uh, like us all, is looking on, wondering what it is that is taking place in the land. Don't imagine this is just an unprovoked, brutal attack by a bunch of terrorists from Gaza. It's much more than that. The hands that push these killers, killers forward are in Moscow. So it's just interesting, isn't it? Hamas says it's taken dozens of Israelis hostage. The BBC News reported, what we know about Israeli hostages taken by Hamas, a significant number of Israeli civilians and soldiers are being held hostage by Palestinian militant group Hamas in the Gaza Strip, the Israeli military says. Some are alive and some are presumed dead. Children, women, the elderly, the disabled are among those taken. According to Hamas, the number of Israelis captured was several times greater than dozens, and they had take, been taken to locations throughout the Gaza Strip. You turn with me to Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3 is one of our Armageddon chapters, like Ezekiel 38. And the chapter sets out for us some of the events leading up to the great battle of Armageddon, where we see in verse 11, Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen. Gather yourselves together round about. Cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of judgment, Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle. The harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, the fats overflow. For their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. In the valley of threshing. So, so that, that's Armageddon language. The nations being pulled together to Armageddon. But, but just look a little further back in the chapter. Verse 1. Behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. It's Brother Paul Billington that told me some years ago to put in my margin next to verse 1, 1967. I usually did it, so it's in the margin. So we're past verse 1. I will also gather all nations, will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. So there's going to be a, a judgment, the battle of Armageddon. I'll plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they've scattered on the nations and parted my land. Yea, verse 4. And what have you to do with me, 
O Tyre and Zidon, and all the coasts of Palestine. Will you render me a recompense? And if you recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? You've taken my silver and my gold. You've carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem, you've sold to the Grecians. So in the build-up to the battle of Armageddon, there are two groups of people mentioned in verse 4, Tyre and Zidon. Tyre and Zidon, where are Tyre and Zidon based today? Which country would they be in? Lebanon. So, so I try to put a help on the slide here, boys and girls, if you're making a note. So Tyre and Zidon, that's Lebanon. That's the north of uh, the land of Israel. That, that's where a militant organization or a terrorist organization, Hezbollah, are sponsored by Iran. They've also fired rockets into Israel in the last 24 hours to show their support for the Palestinians. So, in verse 4, Tyre and Zidon, you might make a note, Hezbollah, that region. And all the coasts of Palestine, or the revised version says, the regions of Philistia. And, and when we read the regions of Philistia, our minds perhaps straight away go to the Philistines. And the Philistine territory is the ancient territory of Gaza today. And so what we have in Joel 3 and verse 4 is something of the territory of the terrorist organizations who will come to the fore in the last days. And what do they do? They've taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things. The children also of Judah, the children of Jerusalem, they've taken hostages in the last 24 hours. Now, we would never be so foolish just to be saying, having read that, what we've seen in verse 4, that is the perfect fulfillment that we've just seen this weekend. But we would say, when we're looking at the events that are currently unfolding in the Middle East, in the Holy Land, that this verse in the build-up to the Battle of Armageddon, where we're starting to see these peoples come to the fore, and we're starting to see some of their behaviours match what the ancient prophets said would happen. And so now we start to ask ourselves the question, well, what, what next? And we should be absolutely clear, we don't know the details. Who predicted yesterday? I don't think many of us thought that we'd be doing this talk this afternoon. I tell you what, I certainly didn't. But it happened, didn't it? So it's right that we just try to, to, to frame our thinking, to, to, to reflect on it. If nothing else, for our young people and children to, to, to keep our minds focused through the lens of Scripture into what's going on. Well, we don't think there's going to be a quick fix to this. We think it's likely a, a significant conflict will be ahead. I think it's highly likely that Israel will go into Gaza. There'll be a ground offensive and that they will go in because of the hostage situation. They'll have no choice. The possible further involvement of the likes of Hezbollah. The Israeli government and opposition, we think because they've been so crippled, and it's not just us, that there are plenty of commentators across the world who are seeing that because of the crippling of the government, Hamas has been able to seize this unique opportunity. So I think it's likely in the coming days and weeks that, of course, there'll still be continual infighting, as every government there always will be, where men are concerned. But all the same, we think there may be some cooperation in order for the uh, country to be able to make decisions and deal with a war. We think, I certainly do, that the United States and their allies will do everything they can to keep that peace deal on the table. We'll reflect on that shortly. We, we think that the peace of Ezekiel 38 is critical to Bible prophecy. We wonder, and we're getting into speculation here, because we're talking about tomorrow and the next day and the week after and the, the, the month after, the year. But we wonder that Israel may 
justify its position, the government was elected on the premise that they would annex, they would take the West Bank. Now, they've not been in a position to be able to do that for all the reasons we've reflected on already. But we wonder that this may provide a justification for them to say, we've got no choice. We can't have the likes of Hamas uh, as terrorists in our country roaming around the West Bank where we've got uh, our people living. So you wonder that it may become the driver for them to take the mountains of Israel, the West Bank. And we also wonder that watching on the bird's eye view from the north, Russia will subtly, initially, provide support to the Palestinians before, at some stage, it will be less subtle. And they will drop down into the land and they'll come on to the mountains of Israel. Okay, so with that in our minds, let's just see if we can just pull a few bits together. Israel warns of a long war ahead as it battles to push Hamas fighters out. Israel, Hezbollah, exchange fire, raising regional tensions. So he wondered, would Hezbollah be involved? Well, already they fired rockets in support of the Palestinians. Uh, Al Jazeera News Network reports again, fears of a ground invasion of Gaza grow as Israel vows mighty vengeance. They were the words, weren't they, of Benjamin Netanyahu. So we think it's highly likely that they will go in to Gaza. The Times of Israel reported um, this morning, Netanyahu, Lapid and Gantz, so, so this is obviously the Prime Minister and the opposition leaders, discuss forming an emergency government as the country faces war. So this is going to allow them to be able to make decisions that you need to be able to do at a time of warfare in order to be able to mobilize troops and to make strategic decisions that the country will benefit from. Well, what of the Saudi peace deal? Well, if you Google this morning, this afternoon, what of the Saudi peace deal? There are millions of articles, as always. And what you'll see is that nearly all of the world's news outlets and commentators believe that that, new, that that peace deal is now dead in the water. That it will be impossible, from their point of view, for Saudi Arabia to normalize its ties with Israel. Gaza war makes Saudi-Israel deal less likely. Normalization effort takes a violent detour. Israel attack likely linked to a Saudi Arabia peace deal talks. In striking Israel, Hamas also took aim at the Middle East and the peace deal. Hamas attack delivers major blow to Biden's push for, for, for Saudi peace. Biden's hope for the Middle East imperiled by this eruption. Hamas-Israel conflict. Saudi Arabia calls the two-state solution. They're trying to sort of, you know, keep something on the table. Iran support from Hamas for Hamas fan suspicion. It's wrecking Israel. So we ask the question, can this peace deal be rescued? And the truth is, well, we don't know. But what we do know, would you turn back to Ezekiel 38, please? Is that when Gog drops down, when the Russians drop down with Iran and those confederate nations, they're going to come, verse 8, to the land that's been brought back from the sword. Well, that's already happened. They've been brought back, 1948. And they're going to come onto the mountains of Israel. That was only possible from 1967 when Israel retook the West Bank, the mountains of Israel. Clearly, there needed to be some challenge within the mountains of Israel for that to be the center of why Gog would drop. It doesn't say that he's dropping into Jerusalem. It doesn't say Gog is coming into the land. It tells you specifically that Gog is coming onto the West Bank. So we wonder. That the West Bank is going to be central. We know it's going to be central to this conflict unfolding when the King of the North drops down. But the state of Israel at that time, when she comes like a storm, Israel will be dwelling in a peaceful state. Verse 10, thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass. At the same time shall things come into thy mind. This is Gog. And thou shalt think an evil thought. And thou shalt say, I will go up. 
to the land of unwalled villages. I'll go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. That's where they'll come to take the spoil. So when we look at what's happening in, in the land today, there's an element, isn't it, where our hearts can feel, oh, I was hoping that that piece of Ezekiel 38, I was hoping for the Saudi deal to be struck this week, the ties to be normalized, and, and, and my interpretation of Ezekiel 38 to be sorted out. Be reminded, brothers and sisters, young people and friends, the Jews were warned by the Lord Jesus Christ. He warned his close disciples, who no doubt told everyone that the Romans were going to come and besiege Jerusalem. And the Romans came in AD 66. And the believers said, yep, yeah, I, I knew this was going to happen. I knew this was going to happen. Just like us with the Saudi peace. We knew this was going to happen. But then what happened is that the command came back from Rome to turn back. And so the Roman army left the siege of Jerusalem. They left Jerusalem. And the unfaithful looked on and said, I knew. I knew this was never going to happen. I knew that when you were quoting to me that, that, that Jesus of Nazareth said this and said that, I, I knew that wasn't going to happen. Listen, eat, drink and be merry. Don't worry about it. Just live your life. Don't worry about it. They've gone. We know. History tells us the Romans came back. And the most awful atrocity in the city of Jerusalem is history took place. And so when we reflect on that history, we should, although we may feel, how long, O oh Lord, how long? <clears throat> and we should rightly ask that in our prayers. We shouldn't be downhearted. And we shouldn't allow ourselves to think, well, I give up on this. Far from it. The angels are working bringing about the plan and purpose of God in his time. Today is the day of opportunity for all of us to make sure that we're a people prepared for when the Lord does come. And so what of the West Bank? Do you think it's likely that Israel could, could look to completely annex the West Bank? We've seen in the last few months tensions in the West Bank. This article asks this, what does the future look like? With Israel continuing to grow its settlements and entrenching its occupation, a political situation seems distant as ever. Challenges today like the Israeli ultra-nationalist government, the growth of Palestinian armed groups and the fragility of the Palestinian Authority are, are different from previous years, which is why intelligence agencies, diplomats and analysts have been increasingly warning of the likelihood of a massive flare-up. That article was written a couple of months ago. If I was the editor of that newspaper, I'd be getting that guy to write me a few more articles. Because that's what's happened this weekend. The massive flare-up. And, and we've reflected, haven't we? It's part of it is because of this weakened position that Israel are in. That, that, that Netanyahu managed to get back into power as the prime minister. But he had to do so by making many deals, not least with an exceptionally hard right group of ultranationalist Jews who said, yes, we will go into government with you, but on this principle, the first guiding principle of the government in Israel was published, this is early this year, declares that the Jewish people have an exclusive and unquestionable right to all areas of the land of Israel. It says that includes the occupied West Bank and promises to advance and develop settlements there. About 600,000 Jews live in about 140 settlements built since Israel's occupation of the West Bank and East Jerusalem in 1967. In a coalition deal with the ultranationalist Religious Zionism Party, he signed last week, it was, this is back in January, Mr. Netanyahu agreed to retroactively legalize the outposts. He also promised to annex the West Bank while choosing the timing and weighing of all the state of Israel's national and international interests. Such a step would be opposed by Israel's Western and Arab allies. So Netanyahu this year has said it's in his policies 
to annex the West Bank. We wonder that the conflict that we've seen this weekend may be the driver for it. And so we see these settlements in the West Bank. We've seen them grow and grow. We see now over 500,000, and it doesn't stop. Israel, just uh, in the last few months, keeps approving more expansion in the West Bank. Now, you're in Ezekiel 38. Will you just flick back to chapter 36? Because we shouldn't be surprised by this. We're not making any comment on the rights and wrongs of it, but it simply is Bible prophecy being fulfilled. Because... Ezekiel, prophesying over two and a half thousand years ago, said that when the Jews came back to the land, they would come onto the mountains. The mountains are the West Bank. And they would grow and multiply. So, so look, Ezekiel 36, verse 8, O mountains of Israel, you'll shoot forth your branches, you'll yield your fruit to my people of Israel. Verse 10, I will multiply men on you. Uh, verse 9, you will be tilled and sown. So we're not surprised to see headlines like this. Israel to seize 120 acres of Palestinian farmland in the West Bank. The, the Jews will, will farm, we're told. Ezekiel 36 and verse 9. On the West Bank. And so we're interested. Uh, and we're extremely interested to see the language that's used in Ezekiel 36. Where it says in verse 11. I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they will increase and bring fruit, and I will settle you. And that's what we see, don't we, on the West Bank today. The settlements of the Jewish people as they keep building on the West Bank. Brother John Thomas, or Dr. John Thomas, uh, writing as a Christadelphian over 170 years ago, spoke of the fact that he believed from reading his Bible, reading here is equal chapter 36, that before the invasion of the country by Gog, by Russia, he wrote there will be a considerable gathering of Israelites on the mountains of Israel. Now, he doesn't say the West Bank because at that time it wasn't called the West Bank. We'll come to that very shortly. At that time it was simply called, the, it was just the mountains. It was just the geography of the region. It was the mountains of Israel. Today we call that area the West Bank. But he could see from Bible prophecy there would have been a considerable gathering of Israelites on that territory before the Russians dropped down. When he said there would be a considerable gathering of Israelites, do you think he thought there might have been 50 settlers? Do you think he'd have taken, a, what about a thousand, a thousand, a considerable gathering, a thousand? What, what, what about 10,000? Can you imagine if he could see what we're seeing? Over half a million Jews on the mountains of Israel. That's an extraordinary, extraordinary prophecy that's only possibly been able to be fulfilled since 1967. I want to tell you something about this territory. Don't worry, we've got three or four slides left, so hang in there. I want to tell you something about this territory. Because many of you will know, but some of you younger ones won't necessarily know, that the West Bank territory, well, it became called the West Bank because it was taken by Jordan. Now, just go back a little bit. That In the 1940s, when the world looked on and realized after the atrocities of the Second World War, when six million Jews were exterminated uh, in the concentration camps of the Nazis, that the rest of the world, the United Nations, which was newly formed, said, OK, OK, we accept that Israel needs a land. Uh, and they drew up a partition plan in 1947. And then that partition plan was for the Jews and, and for the, the, the Palestinians. And in 1948, the Jews were able to go back to their homeland. At that time, Britain was the overseer. And Britain, who a few decades previously had been extremely supportive of Israel going back to the land, well, they suddenly thought, oh, this isn't quite suiting our economic interests here. And they sort of backed off a bit. But they had to depart when, in 1948, 
The land was to be handed over to Israel. But immediately, war ensued between five Arab countries. So for the 48 wars, in, in, not 48 wars, in 1948 there were five wars. And in that conflict, Jordan took the West Bank. So April the 24th, 1950, they got hold of it. And they kept it. And they called that territory the West Bank. Why? Because their western border was Jordan, the River Jordan, and the bank on the other side of it, well, it was to the west of the Jordan. So they came up, I probably had a uh, think tank, and uh, they thought, what should we call this territory? And they said, you know what we're going to call it? We're going to call it the West Bank, right? That is the territory of the mountains of Israel that we read in Scripture today. Now, there's a little detail that's important. Here in Ezekiel 36, this prophecy is about the West Bank, about the mountains of Israel. I want you to go back a little bit, just to verse 4. Therefore, ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God to the mountains, the hills, the rivers, the valleys, to the desolate waste, to the cities that are forsaken, which become a prey, and derision to the residue of the heathen that are round about. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God. Surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the heathen and against all Idumea. Now, look on the screen there. Can you see Idumea? That's another name for Edom in the territory, the modern territory of Jordan. So, let's look again at verse 5. That God has spoken against all Jordan, which have appointed my land into their possession. What did Jordan do? In 1950, they took the land. They saw the opportunity and they said, we're going to have that land. And it wasn't until 1967, in the Six Day War, that the Jews took the mountains from the Jordanians. And they took control of the West Bank region. Now isn't that amazing that the detail of scripture tells us that it wasn't just any of the nations that it spoke against all the heathen that, that uh, had not looked after the mountains of Israel but the last nation that had it before Israel let's look again at verse 5 I've spoken against the residue of the heathen and against Jordan which have appointed my land to their possession with the joy of all their heart, with despiteful minds, to cast it out for a prey. Thus saith the Lord, verse 7, I've lifted up my hands surely against the heathen that are round about you. They shall bear the shame. But you, O mountains of Israel, you will shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people, to the Jews. And so that's why in 1967, they were able to take back the mountains of Israel. And it's of great significance because, flick the page again back to chapter 38, it's that region that Gog comes down onto. Verse 8, when Russia drops down, they'll drop onto the mountains and they'll come to take a spoil, no doubt. But I think they'll justify themselves, the international community, by saying, we're coming. For the aid of the Palestinians. We're coming to help and support them. We're coming to right the wrongs that Israel have taken the West Bank. And so much of the international community we know will say, we're delighted you've done it. Welcome back to be in the international group of nations. We're so thankful that you've acted in this way. And so brothers and sisters, young people, friends, we wonder, as we look on at the events that are unfolding before our eyes at the moment, we don't do it in any dogmatic way. We're not foolish enough to think that in two years' time, if the Lord still hasn't come, that, that we could be quoted and said, oh, well, you said that. But we're doing our best through the lens of Scripture to try to build our faith as to what may happen before the Lord Jesus Christ returns. We're seeing, aren't we? Headlines across the world. But we know that our God 
the God of Israel, will not cast off his people. He will not forsake his inheritance. And so for all the bloodshed that we've seen, for all the bloodshed that we will see, we've got to hang in there, hold fast to our faith, and know that when we are seeing these signs in the sun, the moon, the stars, we're seeing such distress of nations, we're seeing men's hearts failing them for fear, looking for those things which are coming on the earth. What do we do? We get our heads we look up. We know that when these things begin to come to pass, our heads are up because our redemption draws nigh.